I'm afraid you're going to be bombarded after, the, after four of us and five of us uh, speak. I thought it might be just interesting to see how many of you have been involved in writing an application for a trust or foundation. So just put your hand up if you've been involved in one and leave it up if you're successful. Well, keep, a, have a, have a keep your hand up if you're successful because when you go out afterwards and chatting, you may not be able to get a chance to talk to one enough, but there's a number of people in this room that have had a successful one. So have a chat to them. But also, believe it or not, you might learn more from the people that have had unsuccessful ones. So always use the networks and people around in terms of successful and unsuccessful. We also like to be contacted and happy to be contacted in terms of applications. But there are lots of people who are, have been involved, so use the contacts that you have. So that's a, a starting uh, bit. Um, I just want to talk very briefly about the Helen McPherson Smith Trust, one part of the program that we run. I also want to talk about the uh, Helen McPherson Smith the Bushfire Fund, which I'll talk a little bit about that. And I'll also talk about the LEW Carty Charitable Fund, which is another fund that I also look after. So there'll be three sort of chats in terms of uh, trusts or foundations in terms of this one presentation. But first of all, the Helen McPherson Smith Trust, it's uh, established uh, by our benefactor Helen McPherson Smith. She died in 1951. She was, uh, came from uh, the McPherson family who were pastoralists down the Western District of Victoria. They actually started in Canberra, so thank goodness they moved to Victoria, otherwise we wouldn't have the benefit of these funds. So they moved to Victoria, they got sick of Canberra before even Canberra was uh, put there. And the Smiths who were timber merchants. So the key thing for um, the family, they developed that wealth and that also has a flavour for what sort of trusted foundation we are. So we do favour rural and regional areas as opposed to metropolitan areas. So again, use the regional uh, benefits as, as such in terms of the applications you do. We're established on her death in 1951. In terms of a corpus, it started out as being £275,000, which was an awful lot of money in 1950. It doesn't sound much now, but it's grown a little bit over $80 million now. And we give out about 5 to $6 million per, per, per year. We have three grant rounds per year. One finishes in, one grand, grand, grand closes on the end of this month, September, another one finishes in January, and the third one in April. So you have three bites of the cherry. So worthwhile knowing those sorts of dates. There's a little bit of delay before you get a decision, normally about one or two months at least. So no but a closing date in September if you want your project to start on the 1st of October, because you might not get the decision until 1st of December. So again, there's a little bit of sequencing there. Um, the key thing is obviously it, for us, and like all trusts and foundations, there are differences. So the key thing for us, we can only fund charitable organisations. So you must be a charitable institution, or a public benevolent institution, or a health promotion charity. If you're not one of those three, unfortunately, we're unable to assist you. We can, we can only fund. And that's because we have a, we're determined by a will. And that will has very specific requirements. Unfortunately, in the will, they said charitable organisation, not charitable purposes. So hence, others are able to do other funding. We, we can't. The other side of it is that we can know our will says in situ in Victoria. The organisation must be based, operate, operated and managed in Victoria. And all the funds can only be used for the benefits of Victorians. So I don't think we've got any problems in the meeting today on that one. Um, in terms of our program areas, we have eight program areas and it covers everything from the environment to employment to aged care to disability. Um, health and medical research. In essence, in terms of our program areas, if you can't think of it in terms of the new fit, just think for about another three seconds and you'll fit. So in other words, we are a broad funder. And that's because, again, in the world, it's said for all purposes and for all Victorians, rather than being very specific. Our priority areas and tips in terms of funding for us, projects which involve partnerships, community partnerships, um, individuals, groups, organisations, councils. Again, if your projects have those sorts of things, they go up the pecking order. Projects which leverage funds from other sources, including your own organisation sources. So if you do those sorts of things, you go up the pecking order. If they're pilot <coughs> programs, or encourage innovation. Um, the other side of the thing, we always ask for look, look at projects, are they sustainable beyond our funding? So what happens if we fund it for one year, we fund up to three years in terms of projects. What happens after our funding stops? What's going to happen? And we need to, need to see those sorts of uh, evidence there, what's happening. If you're doing evaluations, more systemic evaluations rather than specific program evaluations. <coughs> Programs that have learnings for other organisations within your sector are very important. Uh, obviously, what we don't fund is, <coughs> yeah, thanks, <coughs> please, um, is, is in terms of um, we don't fund service delivery or ongoing programs. 
So for the program you've been running for the last two years, we're not going to fund the next year because again we ask that question, what happens when we don't fund it? What happens the following year? Is it just replicating a, a demand? And as I said, we fund up to three years in terms of time. Most are 12 months, but the length of time is determined by the project itself. And that's the important part. In terms of the uh, HMS uh, bushfire grants, if we, I'm not sure if there's a few here that are uh, in particular interested in this area, but we've set up a $2 million fund for long-term uh, funding projects very much in terms of it must be community based from the fire affected areas right across the state from those in the end of January right through to February fires not just the, uh, the Black Saturday fires and we're, what we're trying to focus on are projects that involve rebuilding community spirit and community networks so it's things that have been lost or to try and rebuild completely new community networks where it's been completely destroyed. We're working in conjunction with uh, FRRR in terms of their bushfire fund and sharing resources and obviously in terms of Vibra, in terms of its funding uh, priorities to the various community plans which are just about in the final phase of approvals and recommendations. So that's one just to keep in mind in terms of, in terms of communities working in those bushfire affected areas, there are a specific set of guidelines, specific set of um, programs and we're, we see ourselves being involved over the next two to three years at least in terms of those uh, measures. So it is a long term program rather than the immediate support for individuals. The uh, other area I want to just move briefly onto is the LEW Carney Charitable Fund. This is for those who are involved in health and medical research, or in terms of uh, programs. It's more in terms of research and diagnosis, prevention and treatment of physical and mental disorders of human beings. Primarily lab-based, but there are also in terms of clinical trials that comes into that as well, or essential equipment to undertake uh, such work. We give one grant round per year, of which we give out about half a million dollars. So in terms of some of the uh, joint, a number of joint projects between community organisations and university institutions, in terms of clinical research and medical research and health research. So the CARTI is one that is well worth ha having a look at. So if you look up the word CARTI on Google, uh, you should be able to get to the other W CARTI. <coughs> I think in terms of um, all sorts of tips, we're going to hear all the bits and pieces, and hopefully we'll replicate a number of tips do phone us. We're not uh, horrible people at the other end or, or whatever. Do talk to us about your programs and sometimes the earlier the better. The number of times we get phone calls or in meetings and people say this is our pet, this is the project we want you to fund and they go through it in great detail and etc. And then they say oh by the way we're also doing you know, a project in XYZ and sometimes it's a project in XYZ which is the one that in fact will attract our interest. And it, I always say to people, think, think of trust and foundations as personalities. They do change over time. And it is about thinking about your project and how does it match these particular trusts and foundations. And the best way to do that is what you can see. Have a look at the website. On your list there, you've got our list of uh, our website. We produce things like a grants bulletin, annual reports that list all our grants, all our programs. So look them up. Look for what other groups have been given, the amounts, etc. The amounts vary for us. We vary from 1,000 to 1.5 million in terms of grants. Um, 1.5 million ones aren't given out very often. And our trustees have the dilemmas always. If we give out a grant for 100,000, would it be better to give out 5, 20,000 ones or 10, 10,000 grants? And we find the amount sometimes does not indicate the importance. Some of our most successful grants have been 2 and 3,000 or 5,000, not the 100,000 grants. So small amounts can be extremely effective, especially for organisations trying to do something new that they can't afford in their own, under their own budget area, or to do something different, to try something else, or to evaluate something that you're doing. That's one of the real beauties of philanthropy, is that it's about risk funding, trying new different things, giving something a go or evaluate for the next case, building up a case sometimes just for funding. We get a lot of applications from agencies who want to build up a case to get funding. So we do that too. So it's a feasibility study, it's a trial. So again, it doesn't have to be for successful projects. It's a matter of actually building up expertise, building up opportunities, and seeing if there are better ways to get systemic change in terms of the social sector. So the, the contact details are on the uh, sheet in front of you. <coughs> have a look at the website, you can subscribe to our grants bulletin so you can get to see what we do fund and don't fund. At any one stage, we have about 200 active projects across the state. So there's lots of activities, lots of things we get involved with, and sometimes that's useful. 
it could be that we might put you in touch with someone else who's doing or starting the whole the same thing that you want to do, or someone else we can put you in contact with, because we're dealing with organisations every day and right across the sectors. So there are other benefits, in fact, of having a chat or maybe talking to us or asking us a question. Thank you. That's my <coughs> I now have the pleasure of introducing Jan Robbins, who's the Executive Officer of the Jack Buckley Foundation. Thank you.